Okay. <clears throat> I want to um, add to that, to what I've just now said, a little bit of Klein. Um, then I want to have um, another approach from Winnicott. Um, and then I might return to um, some occult uh, literary examples um, to think about some of these problems. Um, I've already um, said a little bit about this, but I think it's important, and especially in relationship to mourning, but I want to say it again, and perhaps more extensively, um, especially since we just now introduced Klein again in the infernal setting of body switching and projective identification. Um, she, um, by the time she writes her 1940 essay, uh, Mourning in his Relation to Manic Depressive States, um, she has developed um, a new model for uh, the psychoanalytic understanding of mourning, which she bases uh, on a close reading of Freud's 1917 text, Mourning and Melancholia. Um, in the course of the essay, um, she's going to uh, argue um, that we, um, from the start of development, begin building up and harboring an internal world of doubles um, from the outside world. So the outside world of direct or first contact um, is internalized and doubled um, beyond uh, the boundary between life and death. To that extent, uh, the doubles could be seen over time as also ghostly. Um, but another, uh, really a simulacrum, <laughs> simulacrum three or to whatever power, um, um, uh, could also be seen, therefore, as modeled on the notion of the inner world. Um, so from her point of view, she, um, uh, she gives um, absolute authority and importance um, to the internal good object, which is the keystone um, of the inner world, because it alone can be proof, can prove proof against um, all the um, traumatizing disappointments coming at us with the outside world. Only um, the internalization of the good breast and the good, or the good object, as she puts it, um, gives us the fortitude. Um, um, uh, it's our only chance of fortitude, um, a certain kind of fortitude in the face of what um, external reality uh, holds in store for us. Um, so um, it's important to um, uh, see that it's in this development of the argument while reading Freud closely, that she reintroduces the notion of reality testing. Reality testing um, is something that Freud mentions really only in passing, without um, too much um, uh, elaboration. It's an egoic device um, that um, um, uh, reaches out through motility um, to make certain adjustments and is more metapsychological. Um, identification um, of it. Um, uh, but as uh, Klein underscores, it comes up three times in the essay, Morning and Melancholia. Three times, which is unheard of, reality testing uh, is pressed into the service of understanding the work of mourning. Um, something uh, which means, among other things, of course, that uh, reality testing, however, we end up understanding it is closely linked to mourning itself. Um, so, um, without going into the details, because we're not on the same page now, let me just say that reality testing is um, the, wor the word, the concept, the image that Klein will use again and again to talk about how uh, uh, different objects within the inner world relate not only to one another, but how they relate um, to the external world or reality. Um, but she always gives privilege to the inner world, suggesting that what the outer world is good for over time is to give um, 
a kind of plain text, um, a um, version of reality that is less muddled um, by fantasy, so that in it one can attempt to read more clearly um, the relational reality of the inner world. Um, it is kind of a control. External reality is a control um, for one's ongoing work of shoring up, um, maintaining, um, in the first place, So what I said already, um, and I'll say it again, is that this is how she changes um, uh, our uh, understanding of mourning. She says that when um, there is uh, direct contact with loss later in life, or whenever, um, and that direct contact is always a kind of first contact, um, what we do at first um, is um, uh, a rush to uh, the border that has been struck by that loss, you know, the very foundation of the inner world. The work of mourning in the first place consists of reincorporating the good object, objects, of building up, the re-securing the inner world itself. That's what's at stake um, when loss strikes. Um, so um, Freud, uh, in his essay, uh, talks about reality testing um, uh, in terms of, of a, a kind of memorial architecture. We go back through memory and revisit certain um, uh, stations, scenes, <coughs> souvenir stands that were dedicated to the lost other. But we go there um, uh, knowing that that other is lost. We go there to recognize um, the memory of the other and to recognize at the same time that that person um, is gone. Um, it's a paradoxical relationship. Um, many were too quickly um, tempted to, to think that this meant that reality testing, which is why it doesn't have, hasn't had uh, for a long time much credence or value, that it's simply a commonsensical a disp disposal service, a kind of check off list. Oh, I go there and notice that the person's actually gone, and so on and so forth. But what really is happening is that in the course of this um, re encounter and encounter, um, uh, the relationship with the uh, lost other is extended. Each time I go there with um, the notion of the loss, just the same, um, uh, uh, the relationship with the departed is what's in the foreground. And as Klein underscores in her reading of Freud, if you look at Freud closely, and she alone really does look at Freud closely, um, you see that what happens over the time of mourning is that the initial panicked decision before which we are placed, namely, do we join the dead or do we embrace our survival, um, simply dissipates. That pressure is no longer upon us, um, and in her language, um, the lost other um, has, uh, is able to join the other organisms <coughs> um, of the un un inner world, the inner underworld. Sorry. Yes. When there is the loss, there is a desire to join the dead one? Is that it? That's what um, he suggests um, in the beginning. In the beginning, we're put before that decision, which doesn't last. Um, do I affirm my living on, or do I join the departed? Um, that would be uh, a reason why the, the dead are so often and immediately, um, Floyd would argue, seen as inimical. They want to drag us into the realm of the dead. Um, So um, I add that because it's not exactly the same relationship um, to the double uh, as the infernal one that I was trying to introduce here, in which I tried to um, mediate in terms of mourning as my transition, arguing that there has to be contact with that infernal father if the father is to be mournable or even unmournable. Um, not, um, simply disposed of, as it were. Um, and that brought me then to uh, 
Einstein's notion of the inner world, which um, should at least be one layer for thinking about, um, say, the, the various simulacrum worlds um, that we're encountering here in science fiction. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit now um, about uh, Winnicott and, um, and his take on this, or what I'm going to apply as his take on um, today's uh, issue. Um, <coughs> so we saw in uh, surrogates, for example, that there was um, the deregulated choosing of of teen bodies or identities <coughs> um, beyond gender difference and so on uh, within that projected culture industry. And then we saw that the two um, horrifically successful figures of mourning um, are underscored in that film as um, needing to choose themselves um, in the doubling relationship, um, perhaps as photoshopped publicity images, but still as recognizable levels of themselves. Um, so that's the clearest case of what perhaps is always the case. There's always going to be recognition value carried forward in the act of doubling, um, what I called earlier anticipating um, Klein an inner world connection, um, attending the choice. Um, which brings to my mind uh, Winnicott's um, interesting but also turbulent, somehow or seemingly metaphysical distinction between false and true selves that I want to um, uh, reintroduce the notion within our um, psychic context now. Um, the distinction um, uh, isn't just a um, an abyssal one, but there's probably always an alternation uh, in the relationship between the false and the true or spontaneous self. Um, Winnicott uh, considers that the compliant self, or if you prefer mask, um, is always um, put on, but it's a false self. The false self is something that is hard to get rid of. Um, the false self um, is not just a mask you can quickly take off again, but it's the compliant self that has been installed um, because um, at one point very early on, uh, the, a young child endured what he refers to as um, an interruption of an uh, impingement upon continuity of being. This is the language he uses. Um, but uh, something in the holding environment whereby he includes the mother but extends um, that interpersonal figure. Um, something in the holding environment um, uh, failed to support uh, the young child at one point. There was an interruption, an impingement, um, and so the um, stop gap, the um, emergency continuity shot of the false self um, uh, is introduced. So, um, having said that, um, I'm reminded of an example he gives in a case study uh, of his work with uh, borderline patients. Um, and he says that typically the borderline uh, wears a false self, which is what, which is the self the patient brings to treatment. Uh, and it's where um, uh, analysts um, often fail in their task, he feels. Because treating um, the neurotic um, false self doesn't really go anywhere. Um, though, he says, it's fine because psychoanalysis is a, a kind of um, holding cell, as it were, uh, and keeps the border <coughs> patient uh, contained. Um, if one were to see psychoanalysis as a lifestyle, being in psychoanalysis, being in analysis, as a lifestyle, which he rejects. Um, and, but then he adds um, uh, that in any event, though, if the analysis continues um, uh, long enough under the false premises, 
then the possibility of dying of some disease um, uh, increases and the patient will have been preserved from suicide. <laughs> exactly. That's all we really care about is deferring suicide. Remember, that's what Faust is about. That's what everything's about. <laughs> um, uh, the one um, uh, therapeutic scenario he gives several times, though, is the situation where the false self can be construed as a guardian of the true self, the spontaneous self, and then the analyst can form an alliance, not only an alliance with the false self, but then usurp its role, um, and uh, allow uh, thereby. The, but I, it sounds funny to talk about the um, true self emerging, but let's say the relationship, um, which he calls the true self, the relationship this is that much more helpful but just spontaneity um, so um, he also um, uh, argues that uh, psychosis in particular um, is the most uh, efficient guardian um, of the true self um, psychosis would be in its entirety a kind of false self or as he refers to it private asylum, or we could even call it a kind of crypt, um, that preserves um, uh, the true self, the spontaneous self, intact. However, the problem is, is that uh, that self um, is never given the outside chance of changing, of being <coughs> influenced, um, um, of leading um, um, or uh, conducting uh, reality testing of its own. So, all of this is fraught with fragility. Um, I hope you can appreciate. So even though I have offered Winnicott as a seemingly um, uh, less unsavory model for thinking about the relationship to the double, um, I have to underscore something that I've found again and again of uh, working more closely with Winnicott in the last couple of years is that um, even though he's so famous for the good enough mother, um, which we tend to receive as a notion that um, uh, takes away all that fateful responsibility from the first object, from the, from the first mother, um, uh, allows for a certain um, uh, imperfection, as it were, uh, in the close quarters of the first contact, but really what it means <laughs> is that it's never good enough. <laughs> Nothing in the beginning is good enough to protect, protect the young child from the consequences of some of these things that I've been talking about. Yeah. This may be off base, but could this possibly serve as an explanation for the increase, uh, the rate of technology, uh, develop, technological development, excuse me? Uh, versus uh, ethical considerations for that development? It, it certainly could. Um, because um, to get back to my former um, theme, that of psychopathy as the consolidation of antisocial tendencies, um, he sees um, that figure in his um, uh, scan here as um, as the new everyman, the new norm, because um, in the acting out, in the constant testing of the environment, um, to determine if the environment can hold turbulence, for example, all of that, while well, it's a you know, sort of a slightly skewed from the origin deprivation and of the psychopathy that followed from it, um, which is why it's an endless process, usually, of all that testing of the environment. But in that motility, in that momentum, um, uh, <coughs> anti-social child going on the psychopath um, remains in relation to the spontaneous self. <laughs> so that would be the where, the where to go if you wanted to um, add 
bring that up to your observation. Um, but let, I'm just going to say something um, quickly now about the transitional object, um, his most famous uh, contribution to psychoanalytic theory. I'm sure you're all familiar with the blank key and so on and so forth that he um, read not just as um, a duplication of the mother, an extension of the mother, but as the first place between the mother and the infant self, um, where the infant um, establishes a relationship between inner and outer um, uh, in the only way that is fortified. In other words, the child um, has to receive um, uh, the transitional object as though he or she had created it. That's the complete picture. So the, the young child has to um, be creating it at the same time phantasmatically, um, even as it is given. That, conjunct, that joining of creating and being given um, is the essence of the transitional object. Um, Winnicott's uh, logo for that, as it were, um, even though I don't know if that is the transitional object itself yet, but he says uh, what he's talking about is seen best in infants who, while they are um, uh, being suckled at the breast, um, will put their thumb in their mouths at the same time. That is that um, uh, conjoining of the creative impulse, let's just call it that, and the ability to receive at the border between inner and outer worlds. It's the border where we are for the rest of our lives. We call it play, which follows from the transitional object. We are always um, making that border zone habitable. Um, but what we also need is respite from the ongoing attention to that relationship at the border. Um, and that's, as I said before, where he um, extends or reapplies the notion of sublimation via the transitional object, because the transitional object is carried over and then um, uh, undergoes uh, certain transformations or internalizations, of course, because we need that as the moment that both commemorates um, that joining, but also gives us a respite from the tension of having to refind it, reattach it, uh, reposit it over and over again. So it's the um, it's a big notion for Winnicott. It is the um, it's that which makes uh, reality um, even more special, psychic reality <coughs> bearable. Anyway. To close this um, aside, sorry. yeah, I'm sorry. By by exchanging the breath, but the figure it means that the child both creates has the sense that he's creating the breath itself. at the same time. That's important. So he's uh, uh, or she, the baby, is drinking um, from the mother's breast, and at the same time tries to get the thumb in there to something that he apparently saw a few times. But to his mind, that's the that's already the place that he's trying to explore with his notion of the transitional object. Um, so anyway, when the transitional object is introduced in his theorization, and it's always introduced in the same way, um, it's set up as a kind of epitaph in the text, you'll see this at least six times in his oeuvre, and it, um, uh, often is in its entirety in italics, or gets to a certain um, italicized foundation, which always reads the same way. It's this really this encrypted monument in his text. And this is the fine print at the very bottom of that monument. Of the transitional object, it can be said that it is a matter of agreement between us and the baby that we will never ask the question, did you conceive of this, or was it presented to you from without? The important point is that no decision on this point is expected. The question is not to be formed. <coughs> that is an open invitational to traumatization. <laughs> I don't know what other example to think of. So, um, Winnicott um, uh, is interesting to turn to if one wants to see um, how close we are in our development to uh, the prospect of what he calls impingement, but I don't like um, Is there, are there questions about this? This was my um, 
Freudian, Kleinian, and Nicotian um, survey, hopefully uh, tweaked so as to address some of the, our issues. Yeah. So the, um, the, the proposal of one part is really wanting to inhabit a kind of psychoanalytic um, lifestyle, but even that. So it's a very kind of pessimistic relationship here. It's not... No, he says it's better to be a psychopath <laughs> than to be in the psychoanalytic kind of lifestyle. <laughs> and so, so a follow-up question. So then the false self is a self rooted in repression that is based on superego junctions from a kind of outer world to a degree. Mm-hmm. And then that is a kind of um, construct that serves to protect ego. Right? Um, but then this this notion of spontaneous self seems a kind of um, what does this mean? A kind of a, a purely trapped inner child kind of idea? You know we have to fill in that blank. He never does. He really only talks about the false self. That's our, the only, um, the only um, clue he gives is when he uh, uses at one point true self and spontaneous self mm-hmm. interchangeably. Or, I guess it becomes clearest when he talks about uh, the antisocial child mm-hmm. in terms of the spontaneous self. Not quite there, but in a relationship to it through the act of that. Uh, um, he has signed up with his father um, to um, enter what he refers to repeatedly as the house of mourning um, and marry uh, the substitute and thus uh, continue uh, the family line as the, uh, the appropriate response um, to loss. Um, and uh, he also stands in that relationship with his own monster with regard to the creation of a mate. Um, the impossibility of both contractual relations um, um, refer to one another um, in some sense. But what the, the novel also um, suggests at the end, remember in the end, um, Victor dies um, and the monster um, uh, grieves over the Creator. Um, uh, So that uh, although Victor uh, refuses to mourn, um, still mourning takes place, even if it's the monster he created in the mother's place, who in the end grieves at that moment like a mother um, over um, uh, uh, Victor. Um, So it it raises um, our ongoing issue um, with um, the possibility of um, doing without mourning, of separating entirely from some relationship to trauma, um, whether it is trauma we metabolize or it uses the occasion for starting over in, uh, um, you know, with all kinds of differences. But the relationship itself um, to the loss um, seems hard to um, conceive of as separable once and for all, um, at least in some of these um, fictions. So, um, in um, before I talk about Dracula, um, the zombie films, <coughs> or um, zombieism, I refer to zombieism as a good example of the crisis of uncanniness, remember, when we talked about what happens when we overstay um, uh, our um, uh, period in the uh, in primary narcissism, uh, which is then uh, repeated in Zax's uh, interpretation of uh, the success of the Greeks up to a certain point. There is some frontier zone where the Lemurs, the sort of zombies that begin to gather and present things more immediately a, a crisis in uncanniness. For us, one can't get out from under um, the body as measure of the um, relationship between life and death, if the body that simply decays without end in our faces. That is the crisis um, that sex, I think, is referring to. Um, and um, 
something that zombie films um, explore, usually under the protective, projective guise of um, a kind of amusement park, thrill, uh, entertainment, uh, or game, whereby one can kill <laughs> the dead. Um, that's the greatest pleasure we derive from zombieism, I guess, because it, it never sets itself, um, those fictions never tend not to set themselves forward or before us as relational. Um, it simply uh, gives us the opportunity of um, uh, destroying destruction in some sense. Um, that's why uh, um, after the Bush presidency was over um, and uh, vampire films seemed to be coming back, um, on one occasion I was interviewed about the return of vampirism and I said, it's the return of home. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a great transitional film. Usually the the zombie title, but this was a vampire film. Thirty days of night. Thirty days of night. Yes, thank you. Um, did you all see that film? Yeah, because that's a great transitional film. The title already sort of um, reverses and um, incorporates the typical zombie title. Um, but here, it's not the period of time in which the epidemic becomes unstoppable, but it's the the time out for vampires because the lights are out for that long that they can just. Um, do their own form of mass, uh, mass destruction as vampires without that interruption, you know, um, of having to go down during daylight. Um, and in that film, um, allow me to remind you, it ends, of course, with his um, uh, turning himself into one of the vampires so he can contain the invasion itself and then puts himself out while um, the person close to him grieves over his passing. So it, um, it, it tells us something about what's at stake and the difference between pure zombieism, let's say, and um, uh, vampirism as something that seems to be um, often relational. Strain. The strain. Yeah. And has it um, was it adapted for films? Um, I don't think so. Oh. That's it's, interesting. And so it's the first of the trilogy, trilogy the strain and the fall has been published. So um, did you see Thirty Days of uh, I've seen that oh. um, they, they are um, um, very close to zombies. Yeah. But the difference is they um, they speak they are in relations of um, master-slave kind of among themselves, which um, I don't know how that's handled in this uh, narrative. They if don't, they're both vampires and zombies. They don't, the regular, there's like these master vampires who these speak and again are related to the death of the story. Mm -hmm. um, it also goes into a lot of like mythology, straight away mythology. Um, but they don't, the sort of regular vampires don't, it takes them a while to really become vampires, they go through this transition. But they do have, um, sort of like in, what is it, Dawn of the Dead, they have like an attachment to their, to their former lives. There's this whole thing about a mother who's pursuing a, a, a child um, and trying to kill him and turn him into a vampire. It's also a little bit like I Am Legend, it's like the, um, right. the underground vampire. 
Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, before there was the zombie um, the cult um, phantasm, there was, I am legend, and that sort of was the beginning, at least Romero, who made something quite different out of it, saw that as his inspiration. And in I am legend, the narrative, um, what changes everything to a certain extent is that it's an epidemic. This is the first yeah. mass psychologization of the vampire, as it were, um, as an epidemic condition. Um, it's an interesting um, um, model for the zombieism that then follows. Um, because there's also that development that you're talking about, a development under the sign of mutation. Mm -hmm. um, that cast both humans and the earlier vampires or zombies out of the equation into the future. Um, but uh, according to that sort of model, um, which is um, uh, something that psychoanalysts <coughs> pursued, I know, uh, zombies have become something like infancy, um, which would be another way to recuperate it. For yeah. You read um, Max Grossman's book, um, World War Z. No, sorry. He, he based it on, it's, he took sub circles, the good war, moral history of World War II. He used that as kind of like a people's history of the zombie war. Oh. And then going through like, <laughs> you know, like, like how, how like, the socio-political structures are totally dependent on what would actually happen. And it turns out like, really interesting um, for a sociological like, look at but through these different stories and from around the world kind of thing. But, it might be interesting to see this as another take. It's not just like an amusement park, shoot them up kind of like zombie style. Yeah. No, I, I'm aware that I have to think about this some more. I mean, uh, Dracula as the master text of vampirism is also very much about mass psychology, so it's not like it's remote. Though um, split off, because it's, uh, Dracula is about the mass or people for group psychology of the hunters. Um, yeah. It's also, um, if you look at where, the, the, where the word zombie comes from, it's, it's more this idea of one of the, the film white zombies, or um, in the case, it actually has Bela Lugosi playing a sort of thesis commander of, so it's much, yeah, um, it's much more sort of um, about that, about sort of, about possessing people, but then it, and then I think it was, it is definitely about well, just to complicate matters um, a little bit, um, with then all these influences coming together, um, I tend to read um, Romero's Under the Living Dead uh, in terms of psycho, in terms of the psycho film, that it's as latter film that is responding to the primal slasher film seeking for one of the many ways that we're experimented with to get around the shower scene, the trauma of the shower scene. Because um, uh, before we are given the sci-fi um, information um, uh, on TV or whatever, that it's about radioactivity, that kind of mutation, the first thing we hear on television is that it's a, an epidemic of mass murder. Simulation. But it means that the film really does come out of a, a more specific um, corner that um, I think zombie films in general don't return to necessarily. I'm not quite sure what to make of it, but the CDC just released it, or they published online a guide to surviving the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and it's kind of, I mean, it's supposed to be a like viral marketing thing to give general, like, Sort of preparedness advice, but it's the CDC. Oh, really? Huh. Isn't that with is that like the same as Max Brooks, the same way World War Z wrote the Zombie Survival Guide before? Well, that that like, this is the Center for Disease Control. That's so they like, actually published. I mean, it's like they said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just amusing. The main character in the story is the CDC. The main character in the 
reason I wanted to introduce um, Dracula um, is because of the way in which it, um, the novel, became or can be read as something like the owner's manual to a habitat we still occupy, but which um, is seen at the border of its development as the convergence of media technologization um, and the establishment of a new group, the group that of vampire hunters that um, uh, is established over the um, twice dead body um, of the vampire count. Um, and the way in which this works is interesting um, because I was reminded of Simulacrum 3 in this regard too, that this is a narrative where there really are next to no parental relations. Um, when we introduce when we're introduced to the citizens who will become um, the uh, vampire hunters, there are two parental fig figures who are still hanging on uh, in old age and fatal illness. Um, and they um, are brought into the narrative really only as obstacles, um, getting in the way of the survival of the children, and are easily, I would say, disposed of. These are all um, young adults who have come into money. In other words, there's a lot of passing um, immediately in their background. Um, and that coming into money is pressed into the service of whatever uh, the conflict with the vampire uh, will come to represent. Um, many psychoanalytic readings see the conflict particular between Van Helsing um, and Dracula is something like uh, the showdown between the Oedipal father and the pre-Oedipal father. Uh, to see uh, Dracula's pre-Oedipal is certainly eminently um, possible of only because um, he breastfeeds Mina, his blood, in order to make the telepathic media occult uh, contact with her through her. Um, but um, those of you who haven't read um, Dracula recently um, uh, may not um, remember or realize um, how important the role of uh, gadgets is in the novel, um, which is uh, crucial to the claim I made earlier that the owner's manual. In the course of defeating vampirism, what they discover as the group that's being constituted is that the new media, telegraphy at the front of the line, um, that the new live media um, give them um, uh, greater powers over long distance than those uh, enjoyed by this uh, powerful occult figure. Um, simply because uh, they can be 24-7. This was... Um, um, Stoker's <coughs> forecast, as it were, something that became the law, at least within one um, area of uh, transportation and telecommunication following uh, the Titanic catastrophe, when it was made the law that everything um, uh, passing by sea, at least, would be uh, opened um, via telecommunications 24-7. But the, um, the count, of course, um, has to go down during daylight, at least to some extent, some appreciable extent. And he's referred to, um, for that reason, as being um, in his earthly envelope. Um, so something like uh, the epistolary past, epistolary finitude, epistolary um, uh, uh, dealing with finitude, uh, becomes associated with him um, while um, the vampire hunters um, can remove him, not only through mourning, which plays, does play a role here, um, but through um, declaring him outdated on the turf of um, a long distance communication and transport. Um, at the um, end of the novel, there's a Postscript um, describing uh, the reunion of the vampire hunters. Um, and there, um, uh, we're introduced.
introduced to uh, uh, the baby boy, belonging to, uh, in the meantime to Mina and Jonathan Parker. Um, and as Kitty Kittler um, uh, emphasized, she um, holds the baby uh, on her lap, precisely in the place where the traveling typewriter had been positioned um, throughout the last leg of the um, showdown with the vampire. Um, but I would add to that, too, that you see that it's not only the, um, uh, the relationship to uh, technology, the media technologies at the front of the line, that is celebrated uh, or documented here. The group psychology itself, uh, the group coheres in the first place, it's really a, the fantasy moment, of, as it were, the crucial fantasy moment of the narrative. Um, the group has been able to release one reproductive product um, under great duress and with many delays. The baby boy um, is named after everyone in the group, every uh, male in the group, including um, the name of Quincy who died in the course of the um, conflict. So um, a kind of group commemoration uh, is attached to this one uh, child um, that uh, is celebrated in the group reunion that does not uh, seem to come out of the kind of tension and conflict between group and couple that is thereby, however, at the same time um, denied, announced, implied. Um, so that the most fantastic achievement through technologization and the group psychologization Companies it, is that um, uh, reproduction is very much controlled. The bare minimum is allowed so that there can be, for the time being, that sort of embodied future uh, while well, the group is left intact and uh, within its main and primal habitat of technological connection, um, um, the, uh, the very calculation of only one child for however many people not being good idea in terms of decline of population doesn't isn't considered. Is there something else about technologization that while it requires the bare minimum, this is the fantasy, the bare minimum of um, inclusion of uh, reproduction and death, um, um, nevertheless otherwise spreads out um, uh, another kind of habitat um, that uh, is not uh, necessarily dedicated um, to that kind of embodied um, future. And I think um, more even than everything that Friedrich Kittler um, uh, identified and interpreted for us already, it is this fantasy <laughs> at the end, um, this hybrid fantasy of um, the techno group's predominance that um, connects us up with some of the science fiction symptoms uh, that we can see in the sun. So, um, I thought maybe we could look at um, a portion of Dark City. Uh, you know this film um, appeared the year before The Matrix. Um, and as you'll see, um, uh, Schraber is included as a key uh, mediating figure here. So much comes back around in this world from our, from, from our perspective. Right?
We'll see if we can't hunt ourselves out of our day. Love to you, Emma. <coughs> Start with the prop. Just a little bit. <clears throat> what are we being thrown into here? Science fiction. Yeah, just at the level of set design. Okay, there's that, but I, I would argue it looks like Metropolis. Mm -hmm. It looks like John of Science Fiction. So, um, together with uh, Daniel Walsh and Eva, we're um, thrown into a future place that's also a lab space, like simulacrum, or like one of the simulations in simulacrum. Um, from this cliff, we don't, but we aren't given enough of the But what we did see is that the tuning is being um, used to um, keep changing the conditions of the experiment for the sake of future study. So the human beings are under surveillance, and um, the surveillance is, um, or observation, anyway, scientific observation, and the um, observation uh, reaches a certain high point in, in this cliff when they uh, try to use the memories, both the store of memories, but also potential combinations from memories that are themselves in part fictional, it's curious. But anyway, using memories, um, both real and fictional, as a more per perfect way of tracking someone. Um, what we don't know yet, but um, um, you would if you saw the whole film, is that uh, um, the aliens are, a, um, uh, are dying out, uh, so they turn to humanity um, because they see um, humans um, as being psychically survivors. Um, and so they're studying the humans that they have transported to Metropolis. It's actually a kind of island, for lack of a better word, in, in outer space. We're not really in, on Earth. Um, and in this very controlled environment, um, they are trying to uh, determine um, their own rescue via uh, the human subjects. Um, and yet at this point, um, at this crisis point, they discover that one of the humans uh, is a mutation who can also tune. Tune uh, means, of course, to live within a psychotic delusional system, <laughs> in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to change everything by will alone. And that's the power of the aliens, Nosferatu's 
who immediately appoint Schreber as their contact person and intermediary for the great experiment. How to understand human being from the perspective of psychosis so that survival um, in the future, um, for the aliens at least, um, could become possible. So at that point, at this point, um, the experiment is revealed to be, or or becomes, um, more psychoanalytic. Before, it seemed to be more of a sociolo sociological experiment, changing the class conditions and this, that, or the other over and over again. They don't seem to be getting anywhere. It's not until not until the crisis of mutation, which is the, the first opening, um, that they turn to the incorporation of memories uh, in themselves within the observer um, as um, the new enabling condition um, for continuing the research. He's also at the same time a threat, remember this is, as they themselves know, as the aliens themselves acknowledge, a kind of doomed species that they probably won't learn from this mutational opportunity. And they are at the same time trying to defend themselves against it. Um, I'm not going to be able to finish uh, our reading uh, of the film right now. Uh, I just want to throw out um, the detail that might have been overlooked because it's not so clear in the long clip. Um, but among the um, false experiences and memories that they have been uh, in, uh, uh, injecting into the human subjects, and it's at that point um, that Murdoch begins to mutate, begins not to come under the control of, of the other's tuning is a staging of um, serial murder scenes. Um, so psychopathic violence is the content of scenes uh, in which um, Murdoch's mutation um, is first triggered. Um, so that's what's, what um, German science fiction returns from outer space <laughs> and turns to um, what is not necessarily um, the content or, or inoculation that we associate with German science fiction proper, but a new topic carried over or carried forward or discovered the content of psychopathic violence. Um, it is at this point that something changes uh, in what might otherwise be a, a, a seemingly continuous transmission. Okay, let's have lunch. <laughs> Are there any female aliens? Because that might.